All right, so today we'll talk about uh, Keras and convolutional neural networks. <coughs> so maybe some remarks on the homework. Um, so you probably all saw that uh, the homework four is extended until tomorrow, and uh, I will be posting homework five today. Homework five will be about uh, neural networks and particular convolutional neural networks. And um, you're expected to do homework five on Google Colab. That's so much nicer than what we had in past years because Google Colab basically allows you to get a Jupyter Notebook up and running with a GPU or even a TPU for free. And so um, you should be uh, real happy that you don't have to set up uh, all of this stuff uh, by yourself. Um, last year, I think we used Google Cloud and students basically had to set up all the packages and then had to set up a Jupyter Notebook server and had to SSH tunnel into the server so they could work uh, on their laptops. So this is much nicer this year. Anyway. So now we will be using Keras in the homework, so I already talked about several frameworks last time. So Keras is one that I think is most easy to use, and it's definitely um, flexible enough for us. Um, it's more than flexible enough for what we want to do. Um, there's actually there's two versions of Keras right now, one inside of TensorFlow, one outside of TensorFlow. I'm using the one outside of TensorFlow, but it shouldn't really matter for this, which one you're using. In particular, we will be using the Keras sequential uh, interface that basically is a sequence of layers. So this is uh, particularly nice or works well for specifying feed-forward neural networks, which is basically all the networks we're going to uh, talk about, which is you have a sequence of layers and um, you go from some input via some layers to the output. Each layer is an object. Here you can see um, I'm using dense layers and activation layers, and the model is a sequential model. So sequential just gets a list of layers that it then puts together. Uh, dense layers just mean a dense matrix multiplication. So here in this case, I'm learning something on the MNIST data set, which has 784 input features. Dense 32 means a dense layer with 32 hidden units. So there's a matrix of size 784 times 32 that um, creates the first layer. Here I also have uh, an activation that is specified using ac the activation layer. So this is just the, the dense is just the matrix multiplication basically. Activation in ReLU adds uh, rectified linear nonlinearity. Then I have another dense layer, uh, this time with 10 units. This will be the output layer. Uh, MNIST is a 10 class classification problem, so I need 10 units in the output layer, and I need to use a softmax activation if I want to do multi class classification. So these two one are basically uh, set by the task. There are several other ways you could um, specify this. Um, for example, you can first create a sequential model and then add the layers. So here I just added the first and second layer, then you can add the third, like the dense one, the activation, and so on. Or you can specify uh, the layer size together with the activation um, in just one step. And here, so um, here I just said sequential with two dense layers where the first one has activation real and the second one has activation softmax. So you can see here that for all of these models, uh, sorry, for all of these layers, I need to sp specify the input shape in the first layer because the model doesn't know what the input shape will be because it's a number of features. But for all the subsequent layers, the model knows the number 
of features that are on your input, so it knows that uh, the, the connection from this dense layer to this dense layer will be uh, 32 times 10 matrix. So uh, we only have to declare the input shape in the first layer. Once we created this model, um, there's a nice function called summary. This tells you what are all the layers in your model. And so here they're numbered and uh, they have names, so there's a tense layer, an activation, tense layer, and activation. You can see the output shape, and you can see the number of parameters. Clearly, most of the parameters are in this uh, first dense layer. That is um, 784 times 32, so that's just plus the biases, so that's the number of parameters. And the second dense layer is just um, 32 times 10 plus biases, so that's just 310. Uh, 330 and then you get the total number of parameters here so this is the way to specify a very basic um, multi-layer perceptron with just one hidden layer clearly you could just add more hidden layers and you would have a deeper net so now if we want to learn that uh, or if you want to train this in your network um, we need to set the optimizer this is done in case with the compile method the compile method gets an optimizer and a loss and optionally some metrics you want to track. So your optimizer can be a string or an optimizer object. So there's optimizer objects for all the common optimizers. If you want to tune the parameters, if you don't want to tune the parameters and just use the default ones, you can just provide a string. So here I just provide the string atom. And for um, multi-class classification with um, a self max nonlinearity, the correct loss is categorical cross entropy. So this is basically fixed for classification. If I would do regression, I would use a squared loss. And I'm just tracking accuracy as uh, a metric to evaluate. Well, this is from the Keras documentation, by the way. And then training the model is calling the fit method. This is uh, similar, but not the same as in scikit-learn. Um, there's two, like, well, maybe three differences. Um, so the fit method also gets uh, the data x and the labels y. However, for multi-class classification, you need to do a one-hot encoding of the labels. So you need to have um, a Y that corresponds to the output shape of the network. So here in this case, it would be number of samples times 10. And you can, and there's tools either in uh, Keras or in scikit-learn to do that. And the, or the other difference to scikit-learn is that uh, several of the options are passed to the fit method. So in scikit-learn, all the options are given at construction time. In Keras, they're given at fit time. So for example, the batch size, the number of epochs, whether to be verbose, whether to do, and whether to use validation for early stopping. So here's an example of, given the model that uh, we declared, how can we, um, fit the model on the MNIST. So here I'm loading the MNIST data set. Use the traditional split into 60,000 samples in a training set, 10,000 samples in a test set. I normalize it by dividing it through uh, by uh, 255. So originally it's um, unsigned ins from zero to 255 is a grayscale intensity. And after the scaling, it's between zero and one. So this is just sort of a hatchy min max scaler where I know what the max is. And so, okay, you can see I have 60,000 training samples, 10,000 uh, test samples. And then here I use Keras Utils to categorical to use to do the one hot encoding into um, a vector of length 10. Once I have that, I can use here 
my X train and Y train to build a model using the fit method. And I set the batch size to um, 128. Uh, this is actually, excuse me, on the CPU of my laptop. As I set the number of epochs to something pretty low. So if I would add more epochs, it will definitely work better. And just tell it to be verbose. And if I call this, you'll see all the output of what's happening. Right now, what it shows me is the loss on the training set after each epoch and um, the accuracy on the training set. So the loss is the cross entropy. So we want this to go down. And the accuracy is, well, obviously the accuracy, which is what I told it to track. Or maybe, I, I'm not sure if I used the word epoch before. So epoch means iterations over the training set. So here batch size is 128. That means every time I compute a gradient, I compute a gradient on a chunk of size 128 samples. So I have a window of 128 samples um, that I picked from the training data set, compute the gradient, and uh, apply the gradient update. Then I move to the next chunk of 128, and so on. And uh, going once over the data set in these chunks is uh, an epoch. So each epoch is several updates, it's number of samples divided by batch size, many updates. So something like what, 600 or 400, something like that. So each epoch over all the samples? Yes, each epoch means you once went over all the samples. Okay, the question is if, um, do we shuffle the samples uh, between each epoch? And uh, the answer is usually no, you can do that, but it doesn't really help that much and it makes it slower. And so I think this, the default is not to shuffle. We'll actually talk about um, other things we do uh, later today and next time, but Basically, what, we, what is most commonly done is you just take the training set and you iterate over blocks of the training set in the same order again and again. Uh, so we always start with the same 128 samples? Yeah, like each epoch starts with the same 128 samples. Like theoretically, it would be better to do something different possibly, but we're gonna use so many tricks later on that it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, so we can also use um, a validation set by setting validation split to some number. So here I'm using 10% of the data as validation set. You can see now I'm training on uh, 45,000 samples and validate on 6,000 samples. And so I get the loss, the accuracy, the validation loss, the validation accuracy. And so here you can see after 10 epochs, this is actually not a very good model. Um, of course, I made a very small model because uh, when I made the slides, I couldn't use Google Colab yet because it didn't exist. But, uh, so usually you would want to possibly use early stopping you want, or you want to just have the model train until you see the validation accuracy either not go down anymore or if it starts overfitting and goes up. Once um, we train the model, we can evaluate it on the test set This is very similar to uh, score, but uh, then not entirely. Model not evaluate with the test set uh, data on test set labels, returns a tuple. The tuple has the loss, which we want to minimize, and the accuracy, which we want to maximize. And so you see this is like all pretty similar to scikit-learn, but not entirely. You can also monitor the training more and get more information about the training by using callbacks. Well, you can specify your custom callbacks, but by default, uh, model.fit will give you back an object that will track what's happening during training. And so here, this is called the, I call it the history callback. And this actually contains, for example, uh, a history of the training loss 
and training accuracy. So here I copy over to data frame and plot it. And I can see that this time I did 100 epochs. And you can see that after 100 epochs, um, the training accuracy is like pretty close to one, but the validity, sorry. Oops. Wait. Oh yeah, yeah, the training accuracy, it's confusing because this legend is for these lines, this legend is for these lines. Well, whatever. So the training accuracy is pretty close to one. The validation accuracy is at about 97%. Um, and you can see here on the lock, and it kind of stopped getting better at about 20 iterations. And you can even see if you look at the loss at about like 20 iterations, maybe even a bit earlier, it started to uh, go up. So this means we're overfitting basically. But so it's kind of nice. You can monitor what's happening during training. And there's other callbacks that allow you to stop the training if you see the validation loss go up or the validation accuracy. If you want to use the tools we have in scikit-learn like grid search and cross-validation, because there's these slight differences in the API, we can't use them directly. However, Keras has uh, scikit-learn wrappers, which allow you to build a, a object that is scikit-learn compatible. So there's a Keras classifier and a Keras regressor that are basically uh, things that are scikit-learn compatible uh, estimators for using Keras. The way they work is that they take a method, sorry, a function, and the function is supposed to return the model given some parameters. So here my make model function takes two parameters, the optimizer and the hidden size. These are two parameters that I need when creating the model. Uh, and so the make model fu uh, function needs to return the compiled model. And then Keras classifier exposes it in sort of the right way for us so I can learn to work with it. Keras classifier then also adds all the parameters to fit as constructor parameters to the Keras classifier. So epochs, for example, epochs was a parameter to fit in Keras, but now it is a parameter to init in the Keras classifier because scikit-learn expects all parameters to be specified in init. And so now we can use uh, grid search CV to, um, to tune number of epochs, for example, or the hidden size. So here we, we are tuning the parameters in the model. So here hidden size is the number of hidden nodes. Oh, oh, okay. It's just, I need to declare a function that creates the model. So I can tune whatever I want, but I need to write a function myself that actually creates the model with these parameters. Yes, I could add, have added optimizer here, or I could have uh, say number of layers and then wrote a for loop in here that for each layer it adds a new layer to it. So I can do arbitrary things. I just need to return a, Kara, a compiled Keras model in this function and then Keras sort of wraps it. So you can do um, whatever you want. So if you want to change the, you can add a parameter here that says activation function for layer five. And then in, you can use this when you're creating your model. And then in the parameter grid, I can search over the parameters for activation layer, uh, function in layer five. So really you can, you're like completely flexible in whatever you want to do here. Because uh, given these, these layer construction, um, Keras is very flexible so you can just plug it together however you want, and you can parameterize it however you want using these uh, make model functions. 
So here epochs is possibly not uh, the best thing to search over because early stopping is usually a better idea than searching over it. But I wanted to add epochs here because as an example of something that was a fit parameter in Keras and is now an init parameter in the uh, like basically for the scikit-learn wrapper. Okay, and then I can do the grid search as usual. And here's sort of the result of the grid search. And we see that um, while one epoch is not enough and uh, 10 epochs is better and we need um, a bigger network. Cool. Questions about the sequential interface? So I didn't really talk about any other optimizers. For your homework, you can uh, use whatever optimizers you want, but probably it's fine if you stick with Atom or maybe RMS prop, but I wouldn't worry about it too much because like, there's, like, there's so much out there, but um, we only have time to go over a little bit of it. All right. So the next things I want to talk about, there's two things, basically tricks that people came up with to make neural networks work better, three in particular, and uh, working with convolutional neural networks. I will start with the oldest trick, then we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks, then I'm going to give you the mo two more tricks. And by tricks, I mean papers that now have 20,000 citations. The first one is dropout. Dropout is basically a regularization technique for neural networks. And the way it works is the following. So during training, you want to prevent your model from overfitting. Usually, the, the bigger your model, the better these models work. But if you make it too big, you're just going to overfit like crazy to your training set. The way dropout works is that for each sample in the training set, you randomly set some of the units in it to zero. So instead of using all the hidden units in each layer, for each gradient update for each sample. You change some of the uh, inputs or hidden layer activations to just be zero. This injects a whole lot of noise into the training procedure. If you think about this for the input layer, it just means if you have an image, you just randomly set a bunch of pixels to zero. And clearly that prevents the model from overfitting or like, it, it makes it harder to overfit because you add so much noise. We are also doing this now in the hidden layers. And um, this adds even more noise on an even higher level and makes it even harder to overfit. In particular, the, there's something people might ca uh, call co-adaption where some weights uh, rely on some other weights being present and they kind of evolve together. If you randomly drop out one, some of the weights, the weights need to learn to be independent from each other or they need to be able to do something useful even if you remove some of them. So you add um, a certain level of robustness to the process. So this is what you do during training time. You basically set a whole bunch of the units to zero during training time, and um, so that makes the training much harder and prevents the model from overfitting. Yeah, okay, here's the, the paper. This is by, uh, oh, maybe Jeff Hinton is actually the first author even. So Jeff Hinton is one of the people who worked on this for the last 30 years or something, and so um, he, he actually came up with this. So the dropout rates are actually often quite high. Um, for example, 0.5, meaning 50% of the units are set to zero. 50 is pretty extreme, but you often see something like 30, meaning you remove 30% of the information, say, in the input layer, or you do it in the input layer and in another layer as well, which means you remove a whole bunch of information uh, while you're training. This is one of the reasons why I said um, Keeping the same order in the training set is not that important, uh, is not that harmful, because every time you iterate over a training set, you add noise in a different way. 
So you're basically never seeing the same tr training sample twice because you're adding random noise both on the inputs and in the hidden layers. So there's, getting, there's like a lot of randomization going on. If we want to do predictions, uh, if you want to predict using this network, we're just using all the weights and we downweight them by the rate. Is by the right correct? Yeah. I guess by one minus the right. <laughs> it, would, uh, it makes more sense, yeah. Um, so basically, so that in expectation, the magnitude that goes into a new unit is the same as it was during training. So if during training time, only 70% of the, oh no, it's the, oh, it's actually the, the I, I was right, it's downweighted by the right, yes. If 50%, no wait, it's one minus the, it's one minus the right. Um, if, if, if only 30% uh, of the units go into um, you know, in the next layer, then uh, if you use all of them, you want to multiply them by uh, 0.3. So there's this, there are several interpretations of why this is a good idea. I mean, one is just, we add a whole bunch of noise. Um, and so we make the training set be much more diverse than it looks to be. And basically we have infinitely many samples because we add um, a whole lot of da uh, new data. Another interpretation is the ensemble interpretation that was given in the original paper. And you can think of this as um, every possible dropout configuration represents a different network. They share some of the weights, but no two, two of these networks are the same. So depending on which units you set to zero, you get many different networks. And basically each time you do a gradient update, you do the gradient update on a different network. If you have a single la layer in which you do dropout with P e, uh, equal to 0.5, and let's say you have 100 units, then you have um, by normal you of 100 over 50, many networks, which is like many, um, like way more than we have samples, clearly. And so, and these networks, but these networks share weights in like, in a complex way. And so, you can think of it as training all these networks these like giant family of networks that are all somehow interconnected. And then if you want to do predictions, we just average uh, the predictions by all these networks. So you can actually see that if you do the layer, uh, if you do drop out only on the last layer, then the prediction that you do is approximately the geometric mean of the predictions of all the sub networks. So here, the intuition is that this is something somehow similar to random forests where we have a whole bunch of uh, models. Each was like randomized a lot, but if we aggregate all of them, then uh, the prediction will be good and stable. Only here, we don't explicitly create all these networks. These networks are represented by like some uh, mass of dropping out units during training. Uh, you can implement this pretty simply by in Keras by adding a dropout layer. So after my dense layer with rarely activations, I drop out. And um, I mean in the last layer, of, like the very last layer, I obviously don't want to drop out. It wouldn't make sense. Um, but so here in the first and hidden layer, I use dropout. I didn't use dropout on the input layer. And then um, everything else is the same. So there's an interesting connection of this to input augmentation. We're going to talk about input augmentation more um, next week. As I said before, these are like very data hungry models. And the bigger you can make the model without overfitting, the better. And so by adding noise to the input, you can think of it as having an infinitely big training set. Um, if you just add this sort of salt and pepper noise where you just set something to zero, that's kind of um, a pretty weak way to vary the training set. We're going to talk about 
more interesting ways to create bigger uh, training sets from a given training set. But um, th th this is sort of the simplest way you can think of. I, I create new samples by adding some random noise to my existing samples. And this is what makes me more robust to overfitting. So yeah, so when we use dropout, um, we can use it to avoid overfitting. It allows us to use much deeper and larger models. Of course, it will over, they will overfit less. It slows, slows down training somewhat because we are adding so much noise into the procedure that it makes harder to adjust the weights. And we only update uh, about half the weights with each update. Um, yeah. When, when I tried this on MNIST, I, uh, like the notebook that I, is with the slides, it didn't get better, but that's probably because I don't have a, didn't do it on a GPU. And uh, in general, like when the paper came out, it beat state of the art on MNIST and CIFAR. And so now this is a trick that are, is used basically every time you do neural network training or very commonly. So I would always start with a network that doesn't use dropout and um, Basically, you make it bigger and bigger, and at some point it starts overfitting, and then you can add drop out, and then you can make it even bigger without overfitting. But it will take longer to train. All right, so this was the, the first of uh, many important, um, well, I say recent additions, but this is now like, what, six years? Maybe long, maybe 10 years? Um, okay. Questions about dropout? So the next thing I want to talk about, because it's sort of quite important for the development of neural networks, uh, is convolutional neural networks. This is what is it being used on audio and images and video, and um, has been for many years. The main idea behind convolutional neural network is creating something that is translation invariant and that shares weights at different locations in an image. So it's inspired by image processing very much. If something, if you have a big image and you have a dog over here, it's the same as a dog over there. If you represent um, an image just as a flattened list of pixels, if you move an object in the image by a single pixel, the representation change, changes completely. And the new representation has basically nothing to do with the old representation. But um, we want to somehow use the, the 2D structure of the image and we want to make sure that if we move something a little bit within the image, that the output stays about the same. If I translate an image by one pixel, I want it to be classified the same way. And the tool that we're using for this is um, the ma mathematical operation of convolution, which is used a lot in signal processing. So I'm going to go away from images for a second and talk about 1D signals, because it's much easier to draw things in 1D than in 2D. So the definition of a convolution is that you have two functions, f and g. Let's say they're defined over the integers. Um, the convolution of f and g is that you sum over all uh, m, f of m, times g of n minus m, which sort of is very kind of hard to understand, I think. Uh, and you can uh, see that this is the same as if you do f of n minus m uh, at g. Usually, you think of one of the two, f or m, as being the signal, and the other one as being a filter on the signal. So say f being an image, and g being a filter on the image. So here in the 1D case, let's say we have this signal f. So the signal is usually much, much bigger than the filter. And we have the filter, in this case g, and we apply it at every position of the image. So here, my filter would be minus 1, 2, minus 1. Uh, this is a Laplacian, or, a, well, or a Gaussian, depending on how, what you want. Um, 
And so I, I do multiplication minus 1 times 0, 2 times 1, minus 1 times 2, and uh, add them all up, and I get 0. This is the response on the filter on the first position. Then I take the same filter, apply it to the second position. So I do minus 1 times 1, 2 times 2, minus 1 times 0, add them up, and I get 3. And so on. So I slide the filter over the signal and apply it at every position. If you have um, so another example for a slightly more complicated series. So here, this is a, a 1D signal, um, and I do a convolution with a Gaussian. This is basically just uh, smoothing in 1D. So one way I could I could smoothing would be a top hat filter that's just sort of a box. Uh, another way is to do Gaussian, and this is just a, so this basically is just Gaussian smoothing, and so if I do this, I, after the convolution, I get a more um, smooth series. And it's something we'll see again in time series, uh, and you might have seen before. Um, maybe one detail that um, I should mention here is there's different kinds of convolution called um, full, same, and valid, usually. And the question is, where do I start applying my filter to my signal? So here, I, the way I applied G to F, I started by um, basically applying it at, um, not at the first possible position, but at the second possible position, so that all of G had some, some corresponding input in F. In this case here, this resulted in the signal being shorter, sorry, in the result being shorter than the signal by one. And so this is what's called a valid convolution, where basically I don't pad the input, I only take the input as it is. And so I can't really start at the beginning with my filtering. And so then the result of the filtering will be smaller. By size of the filter, half minus one, something like that. Um, sorry, on each side. So by a size of the filter minus one in total. Um, the other option is basically I pad this so that the output is the same size. So if I added a zero to the left and a zero to the right on F, I would get something out of, so that F convoluted with G is the same side as F. That would be a same convolution and a full convolution would be I pad it so much that as soon as there's any overlap between F and G, um, I get a result. So basically, I would start applying this very right, minus 1 to the 0. And this is when I would get my first result. And so the result would be bigger than the input. And while these three sort of exist, um, I think for simplicity, most people in convolutional neural networks now use the uh, use the same just because it keeps the input constant. All right, so this was the example of doing 1D smoothing. We can also do 2D smoothing. Um, now my, sig my signal is this image. Um, that I took where I used to live in, uh, in the East Village. And uh, my filter is again a Gaussian uh, smoothing filter, but now it's 2D. And so now I take this grid and I apply it to every possible pixel position. And I replace each pixel by a Gaussian weighted average of the surrounding pixel, which is just blurring. Um, to give you another example that's a little bit more interesting, if, you're not use a, if you don't use a Gaussian, but this is called, um, I guess it's called a Sobel filter. It's basically, it's just um, a Gaussian on the y direction and the derivative of a Gaussian in the x direction. So it's like this. This is now an edge detector because you have this contrast between what's left and what's right. 
And so now what it um, responds to so is where the edges are. And edges in a very particular um, scale. So basically, it, it responds to pretty thick edges in the original image. And you can see where there was an, where there was an edge, you get like a black and a white line. And where there wasn't an edge, you get gray. These kind of edge detectors are actually what is um, in our visual system. And this is sort of the motivation of, um, or this is another motivation of why people came up with these convolutional neural networks. Um, our eyes basically work by applying a series of these kind of edge detectors to an image and uh, then processing it further. All right, so how does this relate now to the neural networks? So we replace our matrix multiplication by a convolution. So instead of going from the input to the first hidden layer by using a, a full matrix multiplication, we use a convolution. And the entries of the matrix are replaced by the entries of the filter. And what we want to learn are the entries in this filter. So basically, we randomly initialize this filter, and we want to train a neural network so that um, the filter helps it to do the classification correctly. This actually reduces the complexity of the model immensely, because um, these filters have very few weights, comparatively. So usually, they're something like 5 by 5. So, um, if I have a 5 by 5 filter, it has 25 entries and so I have 25 parameters. If my if image is 100 by 100 and I conv uh, convolve it by a 5 by 5 filter, I also get a hidden layer of size 100. Sorry, of 100 times 100. So both the input is 10,000 and the hidden layer is 10,000 and I have 25 parameters. If I would use a full matrix, it would be not 25 parameters, but it would be 10,000 times 10,000 parameters, which is, would be gigantic. And it would, it would be impossible to learn that many parameters like in that way. So here is a very traditional architecture um, from uh, a convolutional neural network from uh, Jan Lacan's famous paper from, I think, 89, so 1989. Um, wait, is that 30 years now? Yeah. Yes, so this is about 30 years old. Um, it was long ignored and now it's like uh, pretty well widely known. Um, so the idea here is this was done for handwritten uh, character recognition uh, or also for um, MNIST was one of the data sets that they used. Here you have an input image which is 32 times 32. They used valid convolutions. So you see the, um, what they call feature maps are a little bit smaller. Um, so they had convolutions of size five, I guess. Um, and so what it, they learned six convolutional filters leading to six of these feature maps. So each of these feature maps shares the topology of the image. So it's a 2D thing that is just a result of the convolution. And you have six different filters that are learned and that give you six different results. Convolutional neural nets are usually ma made up out of two kinds of things. There's convolutions. And then there's operations that reduce the resolution. In the end, we want to create a classification. Say here, we have a 10 class classification problem. And so um, that's like something very small and compressed, while, the, while this like 28 times 28, or having like 100 times 100 pixels is very sort of wide and very big. And so we're trying to reduce the spatial resolution, um, and here this is done by subsampling. So basically, each 
2 by 2 window here was replaced just by the mean. So this is a factor of two subsampling. Then there's another layer of convolutions. Um, again, they're using four convolutions and they're five by five. So now, um, at least, yeah, here, each new feature map is a sum of the filter results of filters applied to each of these feature maps. So you have 16, so that's actually not how they did it, but that's like how we would do it now, is you would have uh, 16 times six filters. So for each output filter map, you have six filters that are applied in parallel to each of the six input feature maps, and then the output is summed up. And uh, then you do subsampling, and then full connection basically means what was called dense connection in Keras. It's just you flatten everything and do matrix multiplication. So now um, here we had very few parameters actually in these convolutions, and most of the parameters of this network are actually in these full connections in the end. Cool, and I broke my slides. Okay, I don't, I don't think I wanna go fix my slides now. Um, the next slide was supposed to be about max pooling. Um, people don't do the subsampling anymore. They do max pooling. Max pooling means that um, you just, in each two by two window, you replace it with the maximum. That makes doing uh, the gradient back propagation a little bit harder, but it's not, not too bad. Here is um, an example of this original uh, neural network on some variations of the endless data set. And you can see that oh, here, Jan wanted to show that the, uh, the network is robust towards all kinds of obfuscation of the input. And you can see here, this is the input. Um, this is the rep representation in the first hidden layer, oh no, th this, so there's like, there was six feature maps in the first hidden layer, so this is the result of applying si six different convolutions. Then there's the average operation, and then here, much smaller, you can see the result of applying the convolutions to the to these six feature maps, and you do the averaging again, then you have sort of the full connection, and then the classification output come uh, from the network. Okay, the um, question was, how does one figure out an architecture this complex? I was smiling because today's architectures are way, way, way more complex. And we're gonna, in a little bit, we're gonna talk about more complex architectures. Um, I actually, I was thinking about putting in a state-of-the-art architecture, but then I realized that it would take me like half an hour to just explain the architecture. Um, so this, like mo for most of the time, people came up with trial and error. And the, the tricks that I'm gonna talk about later also are trial and error. And people like inspect the networks and like, I don't know, how does research work? I don't know, tried out different things. These days, state of the art actually uses um, similar techniques to what I talked about in the lecture on Bayesian optimization, um, where we do global search. What people do is they search in the space of neural network architectures. And so Google runs many, many different architectures in uh, their cloud on many TPUs, figures out which architectures work well, and then they actually use genetic programming to combine different architectures. And so they automate the search process um, by just trying a whole bunch of things automatically and combining the ones that work well. And so current research is in how to automatically search for better architectures. And uh, one issue with this is you can only do this if you're Google or Facebook. Um, and so these days, if you want to do computer vision, you usually start with an architecture that someone else uh, used and was successful with. Uh, you're gonna play about around on the, on the homework with building some like 
simpler architectures. I mean, the, the main idea here is you have convolution layers and um, you have these subsampling layers. How many features there are, uh, how many filters there are, what's the size of the filters, and so on. That's sort of, you can look at what other people did before. This architecture was actually sort of inspired by the visual cortex. So I, there was like 30 years before him, there was were people mapping the, the retina and uh, the brain, and uh, it took 30 years to go from how the brain works to this. I'm not sure, I think 30 years is about right. Um, another tool that people use um, to inspect what's happening in these models and to improve models, um, or there's like two tools that people use that I want to talk about briefly. Because it's sort of uh, a little bit opaque uh, what these models do. There was one that I liked, uh, that was quite helpful on, on paper uh, about deconvolutions by uh, Matt Zeiler. Um, these are actually filters learned on um, on ImageNet in like a pretty fancy big architecture. It's more complicated than what I've shown so far. Here in the first layer, these are the filters that are learned. So you can see there's like orientational edge filters with different frequencies and like contrast filters and some color detectors. And um, in that paper, they basically created discuss techniques to show how can we visualize what these filters are doing. In particular, how can we do the, visualize this for what filters are doing in the layers higher up? If you look at the, um, at the input features, they work on images, so you can look at them. If you look at filters in the second level, they work on the results of the first level, so they're impossible to interpret. So what they did here is they did what's called deconvolution, which is basically they set one of the units to one and then projected it down to the input space. And um, this is uh, what you can see here. What you can see here and here, for, so this is the filters in layer one. These are for each of the nine units, the patches in the image data set that it uh, responded most to. So you can see this filter here responded to green. This filter here responded to like sharp edges in this direction. This filter here corresponded to like horizontal, like slow edges, and so on. Um, yeah, here this is uh, the second layer filters. This is the deconvolution, so they projected this back to the input space. Um, and you can see uh, here, these are the patches that these filters correspond most to. And you can see this guy here likes like circles, and this here likes bigger circles. This, this guy likes vertical structure that is very fine-grained. This li guy likes less fine-grained vertical structure, and corners, and diagonals, and fur, and yeah, many things. And so here, you see that you go from very simple edges to like more complex structures. Uh, this network has like, how many layers? Uh, I guess this one had like five convolutional layers. Um, if you, oh, should have explained this better. So th these here are projection back of the, from the activations into the input and it shows you like nine examples of that. So the nine things in here, these are all sort of examples of the same thing um, with like some different randomization. If you go in the third layer, you can see even more abstract things. Um, for example, this guy here learned meshes. Uh, this guy learned intersections. This guy learned wheels. This guy learned like red, round, spotty things, which is pretty um, specific. This guy, interestingly, learned faces. There is no class face in the data set it learned from. So humans don't exist. Humans are in the images only accidentally in ImageNet, but there's like a unit in the single network that figured out what a face is. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And if you go up in the hierarchy, you have more and more um, complex filters. So there's a unit 
that corresponds to mostly keyboards. There's a unit corresponding to flowers. Uh, there's a, a unit corresponding to small dogs, to animal eyes, to bicycles, and so on. And so in this way, we can sort of try to figure out what's happening in these neural networks. And generally, the idea is that the higher you go, the more um, spatial or so the more um, of a receptive field it has in the input image. So each of these units can see more of the original image. And so it will um, detect a bigger pattern, but it will also detect a more complex pattern. You can see that um, all these things here, they look quite different on a pixel level, but they all have sort of a similar concept. Also here, like these, these cycles, they all look kind of similar, but on a pixel level, they're quite different. But the network is uh, basically responds to any of these. So I think this was a 2015 paper. In 2017, uh, someone else did a different kind of visualization. It's kind of much, arguably much prettier. Uh, I'm not sure if it's more informative, uh, but if you want to look at very pretty pictures, there's this great uh, paper that's also an interactive paper actually on feature visualization on distill.pub. And so here they created, they, they used gradient descent on the input image to create images that correspond maximally to a given unit. And so you can see that the first layer corresponds to these textures, the third layer corresponds to more complex textures, even more complex textures. Here you see, start seeing something like flowers and dog noses appear. I mean, I guess this guy had already has like dog noses and like soccer balls. And uh, here, this clearly corresponds to some architecture or something like that. So here are two networks that are a little bit more complex, that are very far from like what people are doing these days. Um, just to give you a little bit of an impression, the top one is AlexNet was the first one that really had good results on ImageNet, and this is w the one that people used for a while because it sort of brought back the notions that neural networks can actually be used in computer vision. So this was like the first modern big convolutional neural network. Um, it was distributed over two GPUs, which is why you can see this. Um, and here, so this is layer of convolution, layer of max pooling, layer of convolution, 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 max pooling. Um, and these are like three, five times five convolutions, three times three convolutions, three times three convolutions, and so on. Here there's uh, three input channels, 48 um, feature channels, 128 feature channels, and so on. A uh, couple of years later, there's VTG16, um, that also at some point was say of the art on ImageNet. And uh, this had only, this set here, you see three input channels, I think. Oh, no, sorry. There's three input channels, and there's 64 channels of the same resolution. Then there's uh, 128 channels. Oh, sorry. There, there's like, this is two convolutional layers. Then there's max pooling layer. Then there's three convolutional layers, max pooling layer, three convolutional layer, max pooling layer, three convolutional layer, max pooling layer, three convolutional layer, max pooling layer, and then fully connected, fully connected, fully connected. So this is like, quite more complicated architecture. So here we have like, I don't know, I, I guess 16 layers of convolutions. Is that where the name comes from? Possibly. Um, if you do, you can load the, these networks in Keras. They are all built into Keras. And to here is a very bad resolution of um, what this network looks like in Keras. And you can see all the different convolutional layers. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them. And so the VGG16 is sort of, um, was pretty successful for a while. Uh, this is, I think last year I had students, no, two years ago I had students use that for the assignments. Um, but we are gonna do more fancy things probably. So how are we, let's um, talk about how we're gonna do this with Keras. And then I'll finish with like, the two more really important tricks that made recent networks really good. 
So now we're doing this on uh, MNIST again, but now we need to represent our data as 2D images. So here um, we reshape this um, into number of samples times rows times columns, which is 28 times 28, times, num times number of channels. There's only one channel, it's grayscale. So that's the only thing we need to do to the, um, to the input. Well, the input shape you also now need to specify is number of rows times number of columns times number of channels. I can specify layers in a similar way as we did before, only instead of dense layers, we now use conf2d and max pooling 2d layers. And actually, oh, I made a note. I think I might be using old syntax here, but the idea is, is uh, the same. I think they changed the syntax since I, I made the slide. Um, so here we use a sequential model. I create uh, conf2d. Uh, the two main parameters are the number of these feature maps, which is the number of kernels or of filters that I'm learning, and the size of each kernel or filter. And so here, kernel size is three by three, meaning I have a three times three pixel filter. In modern networks, people use very small filters. Um, so I think sometimes people still use five by five, but I think most filters are either three by three or even one by one. Um, and you can think about what one by one filters mean. Um, so here I create 32 feature maps, each with a three by three filter. Then I do max pooling layer, uh, pool size 2, 2 means I have a sin window of size 2 by 2 that I replace by the maximum. Then I do convolutional layer, max pooling layer. So until here, the network was um, the activation were 2D. Well, 2D plus you had the channels. Now I flatten it. So I only ha have like one long vector. And then I can do dense layers. So here I flatten whatever I had left here, um, which was, okay, yeah, I don't want to calculate this now. But, um, and I add a dense layer with 64 hidden units and then a dense layer with 10 hidden units. Here's a comparison of um, a convolutional neural network and a dense neural network for MNIST. Um, and so you can see that here, I, like these are probably not the most optimum, but some possible configurations. So here I have um, a 2D convolution um, that's actually five by five, max pooling five by five convolution, um, max pooling, flatten, and then two dense layers. And you can see that the number of parameters in these convolutional layers are really, really small because the filters are pr pretty small and I only have a couple of these filters. So here, there's, um, you can see there's much more parameters here because they go from um, basically from having 32 channels to having 32 channels. So there's many filters for each of the 32 channels to each of the other 32 channels where in the beginning I only had one input channel and 32 feature channels, so I only have, um, I have few, fewer filters. If I compare this to a dense network on MNIST with like um, 1,024 hidden units, then this has like many, many more um, parameters. So here I have just two hidden layers. I mean, they're like reasonably wide with a thousand units, but that's not, not crazy. And you can see this has like 20 times, no, 30 times more parameters than this convolutional neural network. Um, all right, so here I can train the convolutional network just as I did with um, the other network. Uh, it just uh, kind of works better and doesn't overfit as much. You can also visualize filters. Oh, yeah, I did 
Fahrenheit three by three filters. So this is the filters I learned in the first. This is for the first layer. The first layer had eight filters, each three by three. And then the second convolutional layer uh, went from the eight feature maps of the first layer to the eight feature maps of the next layer. And so there's 64 three by three filters for connecting the first convolutional and the second convolutional layer. Okay, well, this is what these filters do on MNIST. I don't think it's super interesting. Um, but so you can see that this is the activation after the first hidden layer. So, ah, yeah, this is the activation after the first hidden layer. This is in the second hidden layer. I don't really have an interpretation of this, but well. I think the more important part is basically looking at how do we construct this and then looking at the description. So this is just uh, the Kara summary. It's how it print, it's printed out. Sorry. Okay, so, give me one second. I don't have a note for this slide. Um, so, this is um, the result of filtering. And I think, I, I would have to actually double check, but I'm like 90% certain that this is, I did, um, max pooling and then did, I did another filter. So there's then there's going to be uh, 64 feature maps. No, wait, actually there's also, give me one second. Oh, this is, I used a different network, great. No, okay, there's also, there's, um, there's also eight feature maps. Yeah, okay, so there's, on the second layer there's also eight feature maps, so this is, um, after doing max pooling and another convolution, so the resolution dropped. So this is the representation of um, this number five in this after like two layers of convolution and max pooling. The, the filters are shown here. So none of these are filters. So they're activations. Cool. Other questions? So we have 10 more minutes to go, seven more minutes to go through uh, five more years of technological advantage. Um, there's two, th two main things that I um, still want to talk about, which is batch normalization and residual neural networks. Batch normalization is a technique that's now also used in basically all state-of-the-art neural networks from, well, at least Last time I checked, um, the, these things move very fast, so it's kind of hard to hard to keep track. Batch normalization, actually, there's still some arguments in the literature about why it works or what exactly it does. Um, like, still papers coming out on this, but the basic idea is that you're trying to make sure that the output of each hidden layer on each mini batch has zero mean unit variance. And uh, so what you do is it introduces a new kind of layer, the batch normalization layer. The batch normalization layer has two parameters to be learned, gamma and beta. And what it does is the following. For each mini batch, for the inputs to this layer, it computes the mean and computes the standard deviation. It subtracts the mean, divides by the standard deviation, plus some epsilon. So this means this guy is now uh, zero mean unit variance for this particular mini batch. So you do this separately for each mini batch, basically in your forward pass. 
because you now remove the, the mean and the, uh, change the scale, you then learn parameters in the networks, gamma and beta, that rescale it so that it is like suitable input for the next layer. So this is sort of an internal normalization that every time you see a new mini batch, you apply this normalization, and to sort of compensate for normalization, you add new, two new parameters to rescale. And then you do backpropagation through all of this, and you learn gamma and beta through backpropagation with all, together with all the other parameters. If you want to write down a gradient for this without like TensorFlow or any automatic gradient, it's basically impossible, is what I'm told. I'm gladly I never had to try. Sorry, can you repeat please? Um, what is the benefit of this? What is the benefit of this? Okay, the observed benefit is everything works much better. Um, the motivation, okay, the, um, the originally proposed explanation was that it reduces internal covariate shift, words that are not actually explained. Um, well, they're a little bit explained, but um, the idea is that during training, the magnitude of the activations within the network change. And so if the magnitudes are very small, it might be harder for the model to train because the gradients will be small. And so you want to make sure that basically none of your units die by become, having very low activations. And so you want to make sure all your, the gradients stay on the same, about the same magnitude at, uh, at all times. I think the most recent, I recently saw a paper that actually claims it, what it actually does is like it changes the learning rate in like a very fancy way. And so it's, yeah, it's a little bit hard to understand. Um, so this is just another kind of layer. Um, oh, there was also an argument whether it should be before or after the normalization. And I would have to, I don't know what people say this year. Um, so I would have to look up uh, if, like there's definitely arguments on why it should be before or after normalization, uh, after the activation. I think after the activation is uh, what people do these days. And so, um, yeah, after you, you have your, uh, you can do this in convolutional networks, so this is used in, always in convolutional networks, very often in standard densely connected networks. Um, so you do convolution, you do your activation, and then you do match, batch normalization, you do this for every layer. So basically you add this batch normalization component in there um, after each layer. And then you learn much faster and better. Um, So here, the dotted lines are without batch normalization. The straight lines are with batch normalization. Um, this is with Adam. And you can see, um, or this is on MNIST with the convolutional net. And um, so you learn much faster and better. So everything's great. Um, I do the same for a slightly bigger network. And um, again, you learn much faster and you end up better. I mean, it, it changes the computation of the gradients and this is global optimization. So if you change the computation of the gradients, anything can happen. And so it claims, like, it does improve optimization. You get better models, um, empirically. Uh, so is that because it helps to find better, better variables, or is it The question is, is that because it finds better uh, local minima, or is it because it reduces overfit? I'm not sure if, if these are actually different things. Uh, I mean, well, I guess they are kind of different things. Depends on what you mean by better minima, but, um, okay, so you're asking whether it helps optimization or regularization. I mean, okay, I think this is a good question, but 
I think um, the main claim is it helps optimization, but in reality, it's very unclear. <coughs> it probably does both. Um, so here we see that the validation accuracy is initially higher than the training accuracy. I know that can have something to do with dropout and things like that, but I'm wondering what would, you, what would be the specific explanation. Oh yeah, I didn't say that, but yes, in particular, if you do dropout during the, when you do run through the training set, you don't, uh, sorry, if you run the training set through, you add all this noise. If you just validate, you don't add the noise. So in dropout, the validation accuracy, did I have a dropout layer in here? I didn't, okay. Yeah. That then, uh, in, in dropout, it's very common that your training accuracy is very low. Um, the other thing is that this is MNIST, and if I use the validation set in MNIST, then it's easier than the training set because it's actually the MNIST data set is like split up by um, different people doing writing the letters, and there's like the people in the test set are easier than the people in the training set. Mm -hmm. So we say it's purely an artifact of the MNIST data set. Or um, so if I, if this is actually the architecture I'm using, so if I, if there's no dropout, then I would say it's an artifact of. Uh, Mnist, of weirdness of MNIST. Okay. Like usually you would assume that the uh, training set accuracy is higher than the validation accuracy, unless you use uh, unless you use dropout. All right, I think we're out of time. So I want to explain residual neural networks next time. <laughs>